This is chapter three of how Moons of Darcelon was made. The video game I developed solo, even though the moderators of the solo development subreddit don't believe it and deleted the post I made to promote this video devlog because I'm supposedly violating rule two, game showcases must be made by solo developers. I've already replied to them that they're wrong, that I made the game alone, and they'll probably reply and put the post back online. Right? Right? Am I right? In previous chapters, we saw how the rendering system works, ensuring a strictly retro, pixel-perfect aesthetic capable of rendering even 3D models. However, the aesthetic of Moons of Darcelon is not only based on this. Something extremely important, but that for some reason I think goes unnoticed by most, is the 2D dynamic lighting. How do most pixelated games do it? They don't. This is my first game, Ghosts and DJs, in which the lighting is static meaning the graphics have the lighting with which they were drawn. What you draw is what you get. How do pixelated games that do have dynamic lighting do it? There are two ways to do it, using 3D light and 2D light. Although it seems otherwise, 3D light is the traditional one, since it was created before 2D light. Before implementing the final lighting for Moons of Darcelon, I experimented with various methods to simulate 2D lighting with 3D lights. However, there are two problems. The lights interact with meshes, not sprites. Sprites in 3D engines are represented by a texture on a flat mesh, usually made up of two triangles, but it's a flat surface with no depth. By default, sprites are not affected by light. They are said to be self-illuminated. You can use the special sprite shader, called Diffuse, which can receive light but does not cast shadows. In a world made entirely of sprites, light passes through everything. Characters, walls, everything. Even so, if used creatively, you can achieve impressive lighting effects, as I believe Anton Kudin does in Magosphere, although I'm not entirely sure if he uses 3D lights. I would say he does, because I don't see any projected shadows. There are certain techniques for generating shading using sprites that I don't fully understand, which involve normal maps that manage the volume of the sprites. However, the method for creating them seems too labor-intensive, and I can't imagine making normal maps for each frame of every character animation. So, in summary, before starting to use 2D lighting, 3D lights were typically applied that impact the sprites from a midpoint between the camera and the sprites to create illuminated areas around a sprite. The light illuminates everything equally without casting shadows or interacting with obstacles. This would be the first issue. The second problem is that they generate gradients. If your game does pixel art traditionally, meaning drawing pixel art with chunky pixels and color jumps in your graphic program, 3D lights don't understand pixel art and will generate gradients, completely ignoring the pixel size and their color jumps. They don't even know there's a palette to adhere to. How is lighting done in Moons of Darcelon? It's not 3D light, it's 2D light. This means the first problem is better managed since the lights have a point of origin in the 2D world and are capable of interacting with obstacles, penetrating them to a certain extent and generating shadows from there. The 2D lighting system was not developed by me. It is, or was, an asset that was available on the asset store for a while. I'm not sure what happened to it. I know the developer stopped supporting it and I think it was removed. In any case, there are now other similar assets in the asset store. And thanks to my recent friend Jorgatino, also a solo developer who is developing a way to the stars, I know that Unity now implements a 2D lighting system. The system consists of two types of objects, the light sprites and the light obstacles. And it can generate a texture of the areas that should be illuminated and those that should be dark with intermediate gradations. This texture is then blended with what the camera has filmed to create the final image. Initially, it all sounds great but there are several problems. The system is designed for top-down games, or that's how I see it, because in side-scrollers, the light doesn't distinguish between the main plane and the background. In my case, when everything was filmed with a single camera, the lights illuminated the terrain and objects in the foreground and the mountains that are supposed to be miles away equally. Now you can see how this doesn't happen. The flashlight only illuminates what is in the action plane because, as I explained in previous chapters, the mountains are filmed by another camera. Implementing a second camera to film the parallax, in addition to allowing sub-pixel movement, was the solution to this. In fact, this was the reason I implemented the second camera. The sub-pixel movement was an added extra that turned out great. 
The other problem is that to avoid consuming too much, the resolution of the light texture has to be low, and then apply a blur to everything so that the light pixels are neither too large nor too square. In the specific case of Moons of Darcelon, this isn't a serious problem either. In fact, I prefer the light and shadows generated to be quite blurred as it makes everything look more natural. In Moons of Darcelon, only the terrain is a light obstacle. The rest of the objects that could be light obstacles do not have an associated light obstacle object, which means they do not cast shadows, and the light passes through and illuminates them completely. This actually creates a lighting inconsistency, but no one has noticed, so I guess it's something only I think about. The terrain, on the other hand, has a sprite object that essentially clones the alpha information of the sprite's texture and provides it to the 2D light system as a light blocker. Here we see how the laser shots and their explosions have an associated light source, which is nothing more than a sprite with a diffuse circular shape. However, it is rendered taking into account light obstacles, which are basically alpha information. During the rendering pass, these obstacles are considered to mitigate the light from the light sprite. At the bottom, we see how a normal camera, the Unity Scene Window camera, treats these sprites as normal sprites and cannot make the obstacles interrupt the light. But at the top, in the game camera managed by the 2D lighting system, the light illuminates the contours of nearby walls, but does not pass through them. Well, actually, since in some sections they are not very thick, a small percentage of light does manage to pass through and faintly illuminates the other caves. This is configurable with the penetration value of each light, or, in other words, the absorption value when encountering obstacles. It is not possible to find a perfect value that works ideally in every situation. I like the light to penetrate quite a bit, but at this point in the map, it shouldn't pass through to the other cave. It doesn't make sense. However, if I give it a lower penetration percentage, it would illuminate a smaller surface of the walls and would not look as impressive. This allows a good portion of the terrain to be visible around the contour, which is both a more aesthetic and practical option because otherwise the terrain would be completely black. However, in the case of Moons of Darcelon, this way of the light interacting with the terrain was not entirely satisfactory. At first, without special treatment, the contours were too bright and flat, which did not give a proper sense of volume. To fix this, I had to create a new shader completely independent of the lighting system that generates fake shadows on the contours. In the next chapter of the Moons of Darcelon Making Off, I will tell you how this shader works. I will also explain how ambient light works and how I created a day-night cycle that affects all elements of the level, including a sun that rotates around the level. Subscribe if you don't want to miss it.